um, really had this talk set up nicely by the three previous talks. Um, they've talked really about some of the details that go into vascular imaging, angiography, and stroke. And in assembling this talk, I took a slightly different track. I, I thought I'd talk more about the sort of global, broader strategies. And those of you who are looking for equations would be disappointed. Those of you looking for pulse sequence diagrams might be disappointed as well. I'm going to talk about the things that are important when you're imaging uh, stroke, particularly acute stroke. And uh, much of what I'm going to talk about builds upon what um, the previous three speakers have said. I have one disclosure here. So let's just talk about stroke. Stroke is a, an acute reduction of blood flow to the brain. About 80% of them are due to ischemic events. The remainder are due to hemorrhagic events. We'll really focus primarily on the ischemic events. And towards the end of my talk, I'll actually talk about something that I'm more actively working in now, which is sort of vascular dementia, small vessel diseases, looking at the cumulative reduction in blood supply. So this is sort of an ongoing process, many years worth of, uh, some people would say, many strokes leading to cognitive decline. Uh, I just point out that this is really a, an iceberg type phenomena. It's the number two cause of dementia, and I think all of us are aware of the predictions for dementia in the um, coming decades as our population ages. So acute stroke, this is the physicist engineer's view of looking at um, stroke and uh, the phrase, the catchphrase, time is brain. Uh, stroke is an acute event. We need to treat stroke very rapidly. And here's the picture. You can see severity on the vertical axis, time on the horizontal axis. I've linearized it. Uh, basically, the severity goes up with time. There reaches a point where you have an unfavorable outcome, and that really defines the, the maximum target, if you will, for treatment and um, your patient presents somewhere between zero and hopefully that maximum time for treatment and you can give treatment. Uh, the approved treatment right now is thrombolysis uh, using an agent uh, called TPA. Why is time brain? Well, it's calculated that 1.9 million neurons are lost for every minute during a stroke. So that's the idealization. Imaging plays an important role because it's not quite that simple. Obviously, time is brain. A certain number of neurons are lost per minute of the stroke. But really, we need to understand uh, not this idealized linear example, but maybe patients two and three drawn on the yellow and the black curves here. We need to understand uh, what's happening in a specific patient. They may start off together, but they may have completely different trajectories. In fact, patient number three in yellow there may never actually have an unfavorable outcome. This is really the role of imaging, is to try and decide between these individual patients in the acute setting. Um, talked a little bit about the therapies. Uh, intravenous thrombolysis using TPA has been approved in North America since about 1995. Uh, there's a reference to the, the trial. Intraarterial thrombolysis was attempted uh, using the same agent, but giving it intraarterial in the early 2000s with some success. And most recently, we've had a kind of a new vista in stroke therapy. We're looking at intraarterial therapies using things like such as clot retrieval devices shown in the picture right there, picture on the right there, which actually go in intravascularly and try and snare and withdraw the clot. And there's been a number of studies published last year, um, one from Calgary called the ESCAPE trial, but a couple of others supporting reach, uh, that reached really the same conclusions in large randomized trials. These mechanical retrieval devices are um, are effective. So really there's been two errors in stroke um, in the last uh, 20 or so years. The first error was the error of TPA, tissue plasminogen activase, and that we're now entering the error, we think we're entering the error of intraarterial therapy using uh, clot retrieval devices such as I showed in the previous slide. I want to talk a little about concepts or strategies. and. Um, the era of TPA, we used to think about four things, and Howard Rowley from the University of Wisconsin wrote an editorial in 2001 in AJNR that defined these as the four Ps, the parenchyma, or the tissue, the pipes, or the blood vessels, perfusion, the amount of blood getting to the tissue, and penumbra, which I'll define later in my talk, and try and understand the roles of MR imaging in, in those four areas. We've now entered the three era, the era of intraarterial therapy, or perhaps we've entered the era, I should say. And now we start to think about it slightly differently. We start to think about the core, the ischemic core. We start to think about the clot, in other words, what we're going to try and snare and retrieve. And we also think about collateral flow, because we've now started to appreciate that 
Um, there's a lot of collateralization in the brain. Some people have better collaterals than others, and this can affect the outcome. So we're now looking at the three C's. So I'll focus on the four P's first and go a little bit about how we image parenchyma. And again, I'm not going to go into great detail on the pulse sequences here, the pulse sequence diagrams. I'm going to talk about the concepts and, and why we, we do things. So the first question is very important, is there hemorrhage? So in dealing with ischemic stroke, if we're going to give TPA, which is a clot-busting agent, the last thing we need to do is give that to somebody with a hemorrhage. You could look at hemorrhage using a combination of MR techniques such as a GRE, T2 star weighted GRE, or perhaps the newer SWI. The second question, because it's a risk of being a thrombolytic agent, is there a stroke mimic? So it's often useful to use a T2 weighted or flare imaging <coughs> sequence to try to look at other things that could mimic a stroke, such as multiple sclerosis, tumor, epilepsy. And then you start to get into um, tissue changes that might be specific to acute extreme stroke. So you can do these using T2 and flare in some cases, but really the, the mainstay, and uh, Dr. Mackey showed an example of this already, is diffusion-weighted imaging. And there's also some applications, perhaps, of more quantitative techniques, such as T1 and T2 relaxometry. So just to talk a little bit about diffusion-weighted imaging, we've um, heard about phase contrast this morning, and I, I did, uh, actually did my PhD on phase contrast quite a few years ago. I think this might be my 25th Angio Club meeting, so um, quite a while back. And um, diffusion is kind of like phase contrast on steroids. It was bipolar phase encoding gradients to encode the motion we heard about this morning. They're just tremendously bigger. Instead of coding the coherent motion, we're now trying to encode the incoherent motion between the cells um, in the brain. So I've got a timeline here, and this is actual patient data. It's from a number of years ago, but it illustrates the relationship between T2 changes, apparent diffusion coefficient changes, ADC, as well as the DWI image. And this is the one advantage that uh, MR does have over a competing technology such as CT. It's called the light bulb effect. And as we go through this progression, certainly on the DWI image, I think all of you will be able to identify where the acute ischemic stroke is. So, Less than six hours in the very acute phases of uh, a stroke, we're looking at um, the diffusion changes. is a little bit perhaps on the T2. Uh, there's some ADC changes. The black's indicating a decrease in the ADC, and they're starting to see some enhancement on the DWI. The enhancement, those bright spots in the DWI, is referred to as, as the, the light bulb. 24 hours later, the stroke has evolved, and the blue line at the bottom is showing the evolution, the sort of stereotypical evolution of the diffusion coefficient versus time. At 24 hours, we see that light bulb is much, much brighter on the DWI. We see a very large region of hypo uh, decreases in apparent diffusion coefficient on the ADC map, and some very minor changes on the 24-hour T2. Same patient a week later, a week after the stroke. This, unfortunately, is an untreated patient. You can see that you've got, uh, still got DWI and ADC changes. Well, the ADC changes are a little bit more mixed. Um, some of them have started to normalize. Some of the tissue areas have started to normalize, and we're starting now to see extensive T2 changes on the top figure. And finally, just to complete this montage, roughly a month after the acute ischemic stroke, we're seeing mixed ADC and DWI changes, but very robust T2 changes. So diffusion-weighted imaging gives us this ability to look at ischemic tissue very early on and decide the tissue that is likely infarct and likely going to die. Um, we can see that under six hours on the DWI and the ADC image, and that's really confirmed by the time you get out to one month and look at the T2-weighted image. So moving on to the pipes, there's some questions here that we need to answer. Uh, is there an occlusion or another cause of the stroke? And ideally, can we see an embolus or the thrombus? And uh, we've done a number of uh, studies using techniques such as time of flight here, and we found time of flight sometimes in combination with a time of flight with contrast, such as was discussed in the first talk of this session, are very powerful for us to see. Um, if there's an occlusion in the vessel, you can see it on the time of flight on the left. And there's a suggestion when you look at the individual slice, individual partition on the time of flight with contrast that you may be able to actually see uh, some of the thrombus. It gives the neurologist a good sense of perhaps what they're trying to treat. Contrast enhanced MR angiography, particularly in the carotid arteries, is a very powerful technique. Here's an example similar to what Dr. Mackey showed us. We have a carotid artery stenosis on the left. Uh, the T2 images look unremarkable. The diffusion weighted images, the yellow arrows are pointing to a few little tiny hits 
bright spots in the brain that are likely the result of a, an embolic shower originating from that carotid artery. Those are the first two Ps. The third P is perfusion. And the question here is quite simple. Is there actually cerebral ischemia? And uh, we're interested to see if there's altered patterns of blood flow, blood volume, or meat transit time um, in the brain. And we can do this commonly using a dynamic susceptibility contrast technique. We inject a gadolinium agent into the, the vein. We watch it flow through the brain, imaging with a T2 star weighted EPI se sequence and uh, look at the images and we can start to process the time versus signal curves or convert them if we can to concentration versus signal curves and develop either relative or in some cases attempt to uh, calculate quantitative maps. Here's an example of a patient with a stroke in the right hemisphere highlighted by the white arrows. There's a large region of a CBV or sorry a CBF cerebral blood flow deficit and uh, there's a delay in the transit time and that agrees very well with the follow-up flare imaging. Penumbra, this is the, the, the another in the fourth of the key concepts, the fourth of the P's, is there risk to tissue without intervention? And what we're looking here for is radiograph evidence of tissue that will die without an appropriate intervention. And we actually combine the perfusion, the diffusion imaging here. So this is a patient with an occluded MCA on the right side. You can see the DWI image, there isn't really a very um, robust light bulb effect here, there's probably some evidence of enhancement. We can do the contrast experiment, this is the contrast, or the sorry, the MR signal versus time curves as the contrast agent flows through. We can see on the left side of the brain a very robust, robust, robust response. On the left side of the brain, much more muted response. We can calculate the parametric maps I showed a couple of slides ago, and we can see there's a large region of um, mean transit time delay. So there's a mismatch here between the perfusion, which is much larger than the diffusion deficit. This is the penumbra, or perhaps the tissue at risk that we can identify by MR. So the key questions as we move into the intraarterial therapy era, again, we have to know if there's hemorrhage. Uh, we need to know something about um, is there an intravascular thrombus that is amenable to lysis or mechanical removal? Is there a core of irreversibly affected brain tissue? And fourthly, is there a penumbra or severely ischemic but potentially salvable tissue? Now at our institution, like a number of other institutions, these questions are actually now answered by CT. So I'm being um, very ballsy for an MR angiography meeting. I'm gonna show a few more CT slides. But I think it's important for us to understand how this is done in clinical practice because I think it can actually impact how we may choose to do this in MR as we develop um, new techniques and approaches. So CT imaging acute stroke, it's generally done on a helical CT or a volume CT scanner. First step is a non-contrast CT scan. This is very useful for looking at hemorrhage, obviously. Uh, we can also do something called an aspect score, which is a, a CT version of diffusion without the light bulb. Um, Aspects is a codified system of topographically storing the brain to look at very subtle changes on CT that are associated with ischemic stroke. We can also perhaps look for the dense artery, which gives us information about clot, where the clot might lie. We can do CT angiography, and we can also do CT perfusion. Multi-phase CT angiography um, is a, a multi-pass technique where the table sort of shuttles back and forth as you image the brain. The picture there is shown on the right and you can actually do multiple phases. Here are three examples. You can do an early, a middle, and a late phase, and you can get um, different pictures of the contrast agent as it flows through the, um, the vessels. You can also do CT perfusion with a contrast agent. This is involving, again, an injection into the arm of an iodinated contrast agent and collecting a series of images and processing them to make quantitative maps of things like blood volume, blood flow, mean transit time, much like we can with, with MR imaging. Um, we can also look at the core. So we can look at the combination of the, the uh, non-contrast CT, the multi-phase CTA, as well as the CTP, and we can try and assess the, the volume of tissue that perhaps has a perfusion deficit that suggests it will not recover. And that's shown on the panel, the CTP image here on the right. Uh, we've done some very interesting work at our institution trying to characterize the clot uh, its length and its permeability. And these are some complicated pictures here, but basically we're looking at the transit, uh, the arrival of the contrast agent at various lengths across 
the clot and showing in some cases that we have a positive slope, in some cases we have a negative slope, and that tells us a little bit about the arrival of the contrast agent. Is it coming from a direct path or is it coming from a collateral path? And very important information when you're trying to manage these patients. We can also use the multi-phase idea here to try and establish the, the degree of collateral flow. We're looking at three different patients with good collaterals, intermediate collaterals, and poor collaterals. And we can do this by comparing differences between the three CT phases, the, the early, the mid, and the late. So here's a summary table that tries to summarize what we're doing in CT with what we perhaps could do with MR. I think both can look for hemorrhage. Uh, is there an intravascular thrombus? I think both can do that using a combination of either or a combination of angiographic techniques. Uh, is there a core reversible blow, irreversible infarcted brain? I think again both can do that. And finally, is the penumbra of severely ischemia, but potentially salvageable? And we can do that using concepts from both modalities. So we're trying to put this together, this information together, and we've, we're, we're looking at uh, a, a simpler way, perhaps, to get much of the MR information. And we're developing a sequence that um, essentially is a volumetric sequence. You collect the whole brain during the passage of contrast agent, and we're using a variety of pulse sequence um, approaches, compressive sensing, to um, enable a fast acquisition with suitable spatial and temporal resolution. The panel on the left is, is rotating, uh, as you can see it rotating, the contrast agents is coming in. You can see the, uh, the coronal MIPS every five seconds towards your right there. This is a volumetric acquisition during the contrast agent using a T1 weighted approach. So we can actually calculate from the single acquisition a variety of different parameters. We can do pre and post contrast imaging, which is perhaps not the most useful thing for acute ischemic stroke, but it's certainly useful for other applications such as looking at brain tumors. We can form time-resolved angiograms. And at the bottom, we can also form a variety of different functional maps, such as a T1 map. Um, we can look at uh, per permeability and perfusion parameters, such as these shown in these color maps here. So I want to end up a little bit briefly with what I think is a new vista that uh, hopefully as the angio club continues to, to grow and look at all things vascular, I think we're going to have to start thinking about the aging brain, particularly vascular dementia and the role of small vessel disease. And here's the scary slide. I wasn't going to talk about pockets of pus, but um, some of you are between 45 and 54, 65. I don't think there's anybody who's necessarily 71. This is kind of how our brain deteriorates as we age. And these are actually representative brains from a large 1,500-person study we did, and they represent sort of the average brain size, or more importantly, the average atrophy in the brain as we age. And we're trying to understand what's causing this atrophy, which is well associated with uh, cognitive decline, eventually relating, resulting in conditions such as vascular dementia. So here's just a, a quick montage uh, of different approaches. The approaches are fairly standard. I've talked about them already, but we can look at different vascular diseases, such as recent small subcortical infarcts, lacoons, which are little minor strokes that evacuate in many cases, a preserved vascular origin, white matter hyperintensities, which are the results of very tiny strokes. Often they go undetected, but these can build up over time, and microbleeds. So these are examples of vascular diseases that aren't in the large vessels. So the middle cerebral artery for purpose of this discussion now becomes a large vessel, but we're talking about the perforating arteries, the lenticular striate arteries for, that cause, uh, can have blockages. And I think at some point we're gonna have to actually start thinking about angiography of those structures. I'll skip over this slide and this slide, and I will end up with um, really my summary slide. And I think these are the challenges for MR. So acute stroke, we've developed efficient clinical protocols, certainly for the TPA. In many institutions, I think they have been supplanted by access and availability and ease of use for CT scanners. But those MR protocols, I think, are still uh, quite valid. Some institutions, because of concerns over radiation, particularly in pediatric populations, MR is, is certainly still uh, used frequently. Intra-arterial therapy, I think CT still has a dominant role here, but I think I've showed you with some of the, the slides that um, I think MR might have a really interesting role here in enhancing our ability to manage uh, stroke in the new era of intra-arterial therapy. Vascular dementia, um, I think this is a really a new VISTA development. Propagation of reporting standards was the first step. I was involved with a, a group, a Canadian-European group. We published a paper in 2013 looking at uh, 
the standards opportunities. I think really this vista here is wide open for looking at new quantitative imaging tools and really broadening our definition of angiography. Um, just end with a, a slide here, just acknowledging my collaborators in Calgary. We have an extremely well oiled stroke machine um, with my, my colleagues there on the top row at the Seaman Family Center. Uh, we've worked very closely with them for a number of years, and certainly a lot of my trainees have worked in this area over the last decade. Thank you.